Good evening. Now, when I was just a tiny kid, on the very first day of primary school, the teacher asked us all a question. What do you want to be when you grow up? Now, everyone else started thinking about this, but I panicked. I had no clue what I was going to say. Add to that, I was a shy kid, an anxious kid. I'm still a little bit shy and anxious today, but I'm going to tell you about how I've managed to conquer those. So I started overthinking. I started worrying. And I listened as my other classmates uh, talked about the things they wanted to be when they grew up. One of them wanted to be a football player and play for Manchester United. Another wanted to be an astronaut and go into space. Another wanted to be a ballet dancer. And then it was my turn. I was still panicking. I was still shaking. So I said the very first thing that came into my head. When I grow up, I want to be a dog. <laughs> At the time, I thought this was the perfect idea because dogs have a pretty good life. They don't need to go to school, certainly. They don't have to get jobs when they grow up. They don't have any responsibilities at all, in fact. They just run around chasing bulls, going to the park, playing in the woods. It sounded great. Because honestly, back then I found the human world pretty stressful. As I said, I was a bit of an anxious kid, and I put my hand up in class at school, and when the teacher would call on me, I wouldn't be able to speak. I'd feel so nervous. I'd see other kids in the playground playing football, and I want to join in, but I'd feel tongue-tied about going to join them. So as an anxious kid, I thought being a dog would be so much better. And then I grew up. <laughs> I didn't become a dog, unfortunately. But the world has remained, unfortunately, an anxious place. Switch on the news. What are you going to see? Stories about climate change, about war, about abuse, about corruption. For a distraction, reach for your phone, look at social media, and what are you going to see? You're going to see all the pressures and expectations to live a perfect life. It sometimes feels a bit like we're living in an age of anxiety. So how do I cope with that anxiety? Well, as a kid, I started to write. I couldn't become a dog, but I could certainly write stories about being a dog. And I loved to escape into different stories. Because when I wrote stories, I was in control. I was the one creating the situation. And I could choose exactly what would happen, how I would act, and who would say what. Stories are a kind of safe space. And I grew up. And to this day, I've kept writing because I love writing and I love creating stories and worlds. And I write now many books. I've written books about uh, Tong Dynasty China. I've written books about the mysteries behind one of Van Gogh's paintings. And all of that writing is a way for me to take control of different stories. But today, I don't want to talk about that kind of writing, the writing we do on the page or these days on our laptops. I want to talk about the kind of stories we tell every single day, the kind of stories we tell in our head, in real life. Because those stories are the important ones. Now, as I said, I was an anxious kid, and I turned to stories. And actually, stories helped me because we're all telling stories all of the time. The minute you introduce yourself to someone new, you're telling a story about who you are. When you write a CV and a cover letter, you're adding to a narrative about your identity. When you post on Instagram, you're building that story of who you are. Storytelling and telling stories about ourselves, that's a fundamental human activity. And luckily, it's also good for us. There was a study in 2005 that proved that just a little bit of journaling every day had significant health benefits. It helped people uh, improve their mood, recover from trauma, fight depression, deal with stressful life events, even improve memory. 
Now, why is that? Because when we write about ourselves and our emotions, we're taking control of that story. And it's important to take control of that story instead of letting that story take control of you. Because that's what often happens. It's so easy to say, oh, today I made a mistake. I'm so stupid. It's so easy to say, oh, I'm too lazy to do this now, to build those stories in our head. I know how easy it is because I do it myself all the time. And I sometimes say to myself, I feel like I'm my own worst enemy. And I think that's familiar to all of us. I think we've all at sometimes felt I'm my own worst enemy. I do things that are so problematic for myself. I cause problems for myself all the time. I know I've done it. I've self-sabotaged before. I've listened before to that storytelling voice in my head, the one that says, oh, don't bother trying. I've seen job ads, and these ads look like they would have been perfect for me. And I've thought, okay, I've got to apply. It'd be the perfect job. But then I've heard that voice in my head saying, well, they're never going to want to hire you. What's the point of wasting all your time sending in your CV when you know they'll take one look at it and say, no, thanks? And even if they do look at your CV and call you in for an interview, when they hear you talk, they're going to say, no way do we want him. So why bother? Why set yourself up for rejection? Don't do it. And you know what? In the past, I have listened to that voice. And I've not applied to the jobs or grabbed these opportunities. And looking back, of course, I regret it. I've been my own worst enemy. And think about that phrase for a minute, enemy. What is an enemy? Well, the Cambridge English Dictionary defines an enemy as someone who hates you, someone who is opposed to you, someone who wants to do you harm. That's not good. Hatred, harm, opposition. We think of enemies, we think of wars and battles. Is that really how we want to be thinking about ourselves? Of course not. Now, it's really easy to say, well, it's just a joke. It's not serious. Or enemy, well, it's just one little word. It doesn't matter. But the thing is, it does matter. Because those stories we're telling in our head, the words we're using to describe ourselves, they affect how we interact with others. They affect how we interact with the world. I saw this in practice just last week. My best friend has just started going to the gym. She wants to get in shape. She's decided to get fit. She's so dedicated. She's even hired a personal trainer to help her. And she told me about the session she had at the gym last week. She said she got there and the personal trainer said, okay, today I'm going to push you a bit. I'm going to challenge you. That's what working out is for. I'm going to do a little bit of cardio, a little bit of weightlifting, and then I want you to climb on that uh, Pylomex box. See if you can do that. And she said, no. I think that's a bit too far. I'm never going to be able to climb up that high. Let's try that maybe next session. Let's build up to it. He said, okay. Let her be for a bit. They did the weight training. They did the cardio. And then again, later on, he said, okay, it's time. Give it a go. She said, no, I I really can't do it. And she told me, I didn't want to do it because I I was afraid. What if I tripped and fell? Everyone in the gym would turn around and laugh at me. What if I couldn't do it? Personal trainer would think I was ridiculous, pathetic. Nonetheless, right at the end of the session, he asked again, come on, let's give it a go. And she let him lead her over to the box, and she held his hand tight while she climbed to the top. And she said to me afterwards, I was so embarrassed Can you believe it? An adult woman having to hold this guy's hand. It was humiliating. It was mortifying. In other words, she told me a story about failure, about fear, about embarrassment and humiliation. But look at the facts of those stories. 
She went to the gym. She saw something she was sure she was not going to be able to do, a challenge. By the end of the session, she had met that challenge. She'd achieved that goal. That's not a story of failure or embarrassment. That's a classic success story. It's a story of achievement. What happened then is that she didn't tell the story of success and achievement. She told the story of failure. And she saw herself as a failure, so she described herself that way. And the way we describe ourselves has such an effect on how we interact with others. Now, the world of sports already knows this, that those voices in our heads have an effect on us. That's why you see at these football matches or athletic events, the coaches calling out, you can do this, you've got this, you're stronger than you think, you go, you can do it. Because that builds a positive mindset and that fights against those negative stories we tell in our heads all the time. Now, as I said, I'm a rider. I love riding. I also teach riding. And in the riding classroom, one of the first things I say to students is, when you start riding, the important thing you have to know is who is your audience. Don't start riding till you know who's your audience and who you're riding to. But the fact is, in our daily life, our main audience most of the time is ourselves. We're talking to ourselves in our head as we go through our daily routines. And if we're telling ourselves things like, oh, I'm unlucky, or I'm unlovable, I'm my own worst enemy, then that affects how we see the world. So we've got to fight against that. How are we going to do that? Well, let's think about that now. I know, as I said, I'm a writing teacher, and I know this is not a writing classroom, but nonetheless, I'm going to give you a task to do right now. I'm going to set you some work. What I want you to do is pull out your phone, or if you've got a notepad and pen in front of you, that's fine too. And what I want you to do very quickly is write down three things that you're good at, three things you think you can do well. Yes, I'm checking. Do get your phone out or use the notepad. Just quickly, the first three things that come to your mind. Three things you're good at. What can you do well? Try not to overthink. Just write those first three things that pop into your head. Just three. If you've got more, fantastic. But we just want the first three things that come to your mind, three things you're good at. Did you all manage it? Yeah, most of us did. Okay, fantastic. Because when we write things or think things or tell ourselves things that we can do, we're telling stories. This is often called self-talk, telling ourselves things about ourselves. And if we go back to the world of sports, it's been proved in the field of sports psychology that it's really effective. It's been proved, in fact, that the perception of effort is the main deciding factor in athletic success. In other words, if you think you're doing well, if you think you're putting in effort, that factor is more likely to help you succeed than how fit you are, when you last practiced, how much training you've done, or who your opponent is. Isn't that incredible? So much comes down to the power of our minds. And there was a study that proved this. In 2008, in Emory University, which is in Atlanta, Georgia, they took a big random sample of people. And they split this sample in two, group A and group B. Now, both of them filled with completely random groups of people, all different ages, different genders, uh, different backgrounds. Some of them fit, athletic, playing sports all the time. Some of them had never been to the gym even one time in their lives. So completely random. And they went to group A, and they said, okay, we're going to give you this task in a minute. You're going to hold this uh, hand grip as long as you can, fight against the pressure. 
as long as you can. Now, we know you can do this well because you guys look strong. You can do this. You are strong. You're going to do well at this. We're sure of it. And to the other group, group B, they said nothing. And then they gave them all the task, individual by individual. They had to hold this hand grip, fight against the pressure of it for as long as possible. And what they found was, without exception, people in group A were able to hold it for much longer. On average, 30% longer than the people in group B. And what's more, the people in group A reported that they felt less pain than the people in group B. Why were they able to hold it longer? Why did they feel less pain? Simply because of that story that had been put into their heads. You can do this. You're strong. It's clear then that the stories we tell affect our brains and the way we think. And our brains and the way we think, of course, affect our bodies directly, our sensations of pain, our ability to achieve certain tasks. So when we have these stories we're telling, I'm not good enough, I'm unlucky, I'm unlovable, I'm my own worst enemy, they have a detrimental effect on our brains, our bodies, on the world. So we've got to fight against them. We've got to change those narratives. Something as simple as saying, I am strong, I can do this, has that proven effect. Now, Vincent van Gogh, one of my favorite artists, uh, famously said, if you hear a voice telling you you can't paint, then by all means, paint, and that voice will be silenced. In other words, fight against that voice, that voice that tells us we can't do things, we're not good enough at things. Change that narrative. Do things anyway. Tell yourself you can do them, or tell them yourself it doesn't matter. Yes, you've got to start saying these things out loud, and let me tell you, at first it feels pretty ridiculous to stand up or stand in front of a mirror and say, I'm strong. I'm confident I can achieve these tasks today. You feel a bit silly. But doing it bit by bit really can help. As I said earlier, I wanted to be a dog. Unfortunately, I didn't achieve that ambition. But I did manage to conquer some of my shyness, some of my anxiety. I was a kid that couldn't put up his hand in class because I was worried about talking in front of everyone else. Here I am talking to all of you. Because I've tried to change that narrative in my head. I've told myself positive instead of negative things. Because my story is mine to control. And your story is in your hands too. So I am urging you to start changing the words you use in your head about yourself. They may seem just like silly little words, but don't. Say, don't let yourself say, I'm stupid. Oh, I'm so silly. Oh, I'm my own worst enemy. Oh, I'm unlucky. Oh, I'm unlovable. Change these words. Come back to what you started writing just now, that list of three things that I forced you to write a couple of minutes ago. Let that be the basis for the story you tell, things you can do, things you're good at. Focus on the positives, let go of the negatives to change the story and write a new story and take control of its incredible possibilities. Thank you.